Good evening. How are we, folks? What is going on? Shamim, very welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Um, I, this is, I suppose, Pot's still live back on the air. Um, we are delighted to be sponsored this week by the lovely Rowan Co. Irish Whiskey. You see there's logos all over the place uh, on, on the screen here. Um, it's been a fun few weeks in Irish Whiskey, and I suppose... Uh, probably a good place to start, Shamim, is for the people out there who uh, don't know you. Uh, why don't you give them a little introduction to who you are and uh, all, all good things Irish whiskey, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, I'm Shamim, and uh, I work for Mitchell & Son in the CHQ building at the moment, which is kind of like our, our website uh, operations and a retail as well. Um, I got into whiskey through wine. Uh, because Mitchell and Sunday, obviously they make uh, the spot whiskies, but they were a wine importer and I'd done my like WSETs and wine exams. And uh, when working with the spots and stuff, I took to studying whiskey. And um, I mean, my family would have been whiskey drinkers. Uh, so it was a, a fun pastime for us to be trying all the new whiskies. And, you know, I just became devout kind of overnight. <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with that. So you basically kind of segment or segued from the wine world into the whiskey world a little bit, but toes toes still in the wine world, no doubt. Oh no, yeah, I can't. You can't give up wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fair enough. Um, well, it's it's a good to have you on the show. Uh, people are dropping in from around Ireland and around the world. Val dropping in from Waterford, saying good evening. Um, we will have a number of people, I suppose, dropping in uh, throughout the show. Um, special guests as well, uh, a few whiskeys to try, so it's going to be a fun evening. Um, probably one of the uh, you've got you've got some fans dropping in as well. <laughs> oh, uh, that's um, Emma, who I work with in Mitchell's. Oh, very good. <laughs> Chris Hennessy at Kilkenny saying good evening as well. So, uh, at any point, uh, do feel free to drop in. As I always say, any questions and or banter is widely accepted um so i suppose the the main i suppose sponsors this evening is the lovely folks at rome co so it's always a good a good place to start to say a little shout out to those guys um yes you have exactly <laughs> what i have had in my hand which is uh their fantastic cast strength bottling yeah um, so I like uh yeah they're uh irish only exclusive which is kind of cool um have you got it neat in your hand there do you i do indeed uh, very good. I went uh, with something a little bit different. I went with uh, Alan uh, Alan Mulvihill, their European and slash kind of now global brand ambassador, uh, basically said that the whiskey was designed to be drank in a whiskey soda. So I, I knew you were going with neat, so I decided to sneak in a whiskey soda while I could. But this is absolutely – I was actually – I'm not always the biggest person for whiskey sodas, but this is. I don't. I don't tend to drink soda water much at all. Are we talking like you know, like a vodka soda, that kind of soda water, and not like American soda where it's could be Coke or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Uh, like uh, literally vodka soda water kind of idea. Yeah. It's a kind of carbonated water. I think this is absolutely brilliant. Actually, I'm surprised. It's very kind of citrusy. A little bit of caramel and a little bit of toffee coming through as well. There's a kind of a, it cuts through with a kind of a sweetness, which is quite cool. Uh, yeah, because I think there's a quite of a sweetness on the nose, though, as well. I think it kind of almost butterscotchy. Yeah, yeah. That uh, kind of sweetness with the with the touch of vanilla in there. So kind of, kind of reminds me of like a, an ice cream sundae. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. I I tend to get a little bit of coconut from some of their uh, whiskies, which I kind of get. Um, on, when this is neat, I tend to get a little bit of that as well. Uh, and as I just pulled up on the screen there, there is a bit of love. Uh, coming in for Mr. Mulvihill from <laughs> Rome Co. So that is good to see. Um, yeah, the, as I said, Irish only release. Um, and it's basically their flagship expression at cast strength, which is quite cool. So big thanks to them for sponsoring tonight's episode. Um, I do believe that uh, Alan will be uh, view or dropping in at some point to say hi, at least in the comments. So if you have questions. Oh, that was a really good moment for Alan to, to, to comment. Hey, Alan, what's going on? Um, so if people have questions about any of the Rome Co. products uh, that we talk about tonight, uh, fire them into the uh, comments. If I don't know them, Shmeen doesn't know them, Alan's in, uh, watching along, so he'll be able to answer them too. Um, and I'm going to be sipping on this for the first little while. I'm sure you'll have yours in your hand. We have a few more to be sipping on. But um, 
It's been uh, quite, a, I suppose, quite a few weeks in Irish whiskey since we were last on. Um, there's hundreds of things have been happening all over, um, both in Ireland and abroad. Um, even today, three whiskies just dropped. Uh, just today, were just announced by um, Cologne Distillery and WD O'Connell Whiskey Merchants as well. Um, I did ask the guys if they coordinated that. They did not. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think uh, one of the kind of first things uh, that I wanted to do was uh, welcome um, a guest to the show, uh, somebody who I didn't think I would be having reoccurring guests, but this man has probably been on the show more than I have. Um, and he's going to be talking about the Cologne Experimental Series uh, that was just uh, announced uh this evening, an hour ago. Um, so if if no one minds, I'm going to welcome uh, Brendan Carty to the show. Uh, Brendan, uh, founder of Clone Distillery. So, Brendan, good evening. How are you doing? How you doing, Matt? How are you doing? Hi, how are you? Not too bad. Um, so as I said, I didn't think I'd have... Uh, you must be basically a regular at this point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> part of the show. I've been for you, you know. Exactly. No, exactly. Here. Um, so, Brendan, uh, tell us all. Um, the you've your latest release, the experimental bonded series, uh, Pinot Noir cask. Um, uh, give us the rundown. Yeah, what yeah, kind yeah. of Pinot Noir is it? <laughs> it's the same again. It's the same blend that we've used before. You know, it's uh, 25 percent. Uh, uh, 12 year old malt from uh, Northern Ireland, uh, single malt, and that's mixed in then with the uh, grain and uh, single malt from Cooley. So the majority of it's actually a grain. And uh, we were the whole idea of this series was to try and bring blends back into industry and uh, do some very special thing with those brand, with those blends. And uh, this cask release, uh, the most recent one, is the Pinot Noir cask. So, um, uh, King of all grains. One of the two of them were leaked then during the week. Um, of course, <laughs> the, one of our distributors jumped the gun. So, uh, and it was it was it's been a crazy week. There's a lot going on at Cologne. We're you know trying to make some new drinks, and there's new seltzers going out as well. And yesterday it was there's a lot of tasting involved, and it was sort of pretty tipsy by the end of the day. And then I remembered that I had to get along and <clears throat> send out the press release for today, which was you know obviously a bit late as normal. And um, so I took into this bottle last night. You can see it's half empty. And I started writing taste notes. I was already a little bit tipsy at this stage and probably exhausted. And so I sent around the press release to everybody and those spelling mistakes. And I think it's always the case. But at least uh, there were brand new tasting notes as to the bottle. Everything's probably tasting like Blackberry at the moment, though, because of the seltzers we're making. But, <laughs> you know. But yeah, it, it went very well. So, um, yeah. so I mean, were you asking what what kind of uh... yeah what what Pinot Noir are we talking the Burgundy region or is it Australian yeah. or no? It is. You're right. It's Burgundy region in France. So we sourced the cask from AS Marl, and uh, it was actually it's a beautiful cask. And what the guys do is they remove the liquid from the cask and then they shave the casks and then they gently toast them and put the liquid back in and then take it out again. It's this ritual that they have and they swear by and uh, Alex from ASE Bar is a fascinating guy and he knows his wine and his casks inside out. Um, for us though, this cask was a little bit overpowering. We put this whiskey in at the start. After a few weeks, it just destroyed the whiskey. It was very tannin heavy and it tasted like... Um, That's so you know, unusual for Pinot Noir. Yeah. I know. I, know. I, I think it was the cask as well. And then it just tasted like this lovely, you know, summery, fruity drink. The berries in it, and they're like, right, this is yeah, that sounds like Pinot Noir. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, lovely berry rich flavor. So, we took a quarter of that out, and then we replaced a quarter of it with uh, you know, the same blend ratio again, and just let it in there and let it marry. But by this stage, then it was nearly a little bit underdone, but now it's just come into itself again. And um, this was actually meant to be our first release, and it ended up being number five. So, we're halfway over halfway through the series now. And we've brought this back in, and uh, we're releasing it now because it's ready. Um, but that's the idea: don't, don't release anything unless it's ready, and it's good. It's good to go. So, how did you, I suppose, bring it back? Um, you said you, you kind of what 
it emptied or filled about half of the same blend back in without the Pinot Noir finish. Is that it? That, that's right. And uh, this was actually before we got our hands on that higher end uh, stock from Northern Ireland. Um, the, 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 for, no, higher age stock, the 12 year old single malt. Uh, whenever we added that component in as well, you know, it's fairly, it removed even more of that that lovely wine note. So we had to leave it in there a bit longer. So yeah, we did. We took we took the blend out, and then we replaced it with the same blend component that wasn't that wasn't uh, in contact with the wood at this stage. Um, so and then after a while, we took that out again, and we started. We took twenty uh, percent out of every one of our casks, and we put in the the single malt. And uh, yeah, so this one was the most troublesome, I have to admit, but it turned out lovely in the end. So. I had a, a, I suppose, fortuitous um, delivery this evening, something I wasn't expecting, uh, but this arrived in the door just literally just before we went on air, which was quite cool. So, uh, it's quite professional it, looking label. Uh, looks like <laughs> so long time. <laughs> I, I mean, all of the technical information is there, Pinot Noir, and then in, in a different pen and a different handwriting, Burgundy. Yeah, I knew that was coming on, so I didn't want her. <laughs> um, so as always uh 50 uh, cast strength so 56 percent this release yeah it was indeed but there's less less bottles in it this time um but a higher a higher slightly higher percentage as well so uh i don't know exactly why it happened you know in terms of the angel share it was more of that angel share down to water loss uh, and, you know, because of the cask shape in terms of the, the hot and the cold, maybe there was a drier part of the of the shed that it's sitting in. But uh, that's the way it worked out, yeah. And, I mean, this uh, is... i myself a little glass here. Exactly, Shmeem, I apologize. <laughs> All right, I'll make do with my cask strength row and coke because it's pretty cool. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is lovely. Which is lovely, by the way, yeah. Uh, I mean... This is this is great. It's 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 fruity. It's a lot of red fruit. There's a little bit of honey going on in the background. Yeah, there certainly is. Um, compared to the last one, which is you know sitting in a really old cask, and it, obviously it was slightly peated as well. This one is compared to our other wine cask, the Chocolina cask from the Basque region, which was vibrant, fruit heavy, and uh, this one's going for much more of those berry notes, whereas the other one was going for more of those lemon notes. But yeah. there is a little bit of lemon in here, or as I drunkenly spelt lemon last night, lean in or something. Leon. <laughs> lean on me. See it, Leon, in there. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, so Chris Hennessy is in the comments uh, asking uh, whether or not you framed uh, the Sharpie from the back label yet. You might need to explain that one a little bit. That's right. Um, can you see that? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to I'm going to be polite and we're not going to get angry or anything and we're not going to say any we're not going to talk about any gobshites in the industry or either enforcing the rules or whoever wrote them um, we're just going to explain that uh, we had to remove some of the label from the back of the bottle because we were accused of uh, misleading the consumer and thinking that this was an older whiskey just in case you know before they get to the back label um that might say a different <laughs> number. That says ten year old. Some good so typography water. there. Exactly what the tiny black, small print at the back of the bottle says. It's just more information for the consumer, uh, which is important. Whiskey, so what, whiskey, what, what, what was water. that information that you had to black out? Well, we, I, I suppose we're not allowed to say, but I know we're not allowed to say that it's two thousand and eight um, <laughs> components in there, and you're not allowed to say that. Uh, you know, there's other stuff from 2009 in there as well. In fact, this is actually an 11 year old at this stage, but whenever we didn't realize they were going to be released so sporadically at the start, so we printed all the labels out beforehand. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds like an accountant's decision if ever I've heard one. Yeah, Liam Broken, he's the accountant, and uh, if ever one pound is missing or a euro is missing, he just gets a big stick out and hits me over the head with it, you know. He's a wild man. Does it take you back to your school days? He's a wild man for the pain. He's gonna be he's gonna be the man with no bad debts though. There'll be nobody short knee lads. (laughs) (laughs) I wish that was the case. Yeah. So so you're halfway through the series. Um 
the I suppose the Pinot Noir is is obviously the, the latest that has come out. Remind us what have been the previous forecasts that you've released, and all again, all of the same blend. Uh, yeah, the first one was a Jamaican dark rum, followed by the Basque tequila, and then there was the um, Mexican, sorry, the Basque chocolina cask. Yeah. Then there was the Mexican tequila cask, and then there was the heated Isla cask, which we actually got in a little bit of bother for as well, unfortunately. Um, yeah, we were cool. aiming. The Scottish Whiskey Association felt that we were trying to be Scotch whiskey, but at least they, they were very plausible. They're very nice about it. Um, we said we wouldn't do it again, and that was okay. Um, yeah, and then now we are. So we've got two more left after this, and we'll probably release one, you know, in about six weeks' time again. Uh, yeah. So, so do you think Where? you write your press release in advance this time, or? <laughs> 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 Probably be twelve year old at that stage. <laughs> Don't be misleading the consumer now. I know you're right. You're right. There's a see it lay on in every in every bottle. Um, I think there's, there's actually a little information slip came with this bottle explaining the situation and with an apology as well for vandalizing the back of our labels. So uh, you get it inside your little hessian sack. So everybody will notice that going forward. <laughs> I think it's weird that you're not allowed to if you're not allowed to say it because when we were at the launch for uh, Middleton Very Rare 19, they told us like some whiskey from this year, some of it's 19 years old, some whiskey from that year that's 22 years old. Like we got the uh, blend components all printed down and given to us. So. Are you trying to tell me, Shmeen, that there's some rules for bigger players in the industry than there is for smaller players? Oh, am I showing my naivety? Sort of monopolization like, issue. Right eyed and thinking everything is great. <laughs> <laughs> just oh, just no, play on, play on the side of devil's advocate and not to get us shut down uh, i think i think the distinction there is one is printed on the label and one was not printed on the label oh is, yeah it wasn't okay. on the label but i <laughs> when i'm talking to customers about things like they like to know about blend components and oftentimes yeah. pe customers just want something that they can flex in front of their friends with and that's what they buy you know yeah they do mm -hmm. Uh, so, Brendan, while you're here, not necessarily Irish whiskey, but uh, you have jumped into the world of uh, gin seltzers. Uh, give us a, a quick uh, a quick rundown on that before uh, before we part ways. Gin seltzers, it's, it's the sort of thing that gets you out of bed in the morning. Um, <laughs> no, they're lovely. Uh, it's, we like a challenge. And, uh, we also like to keep the doors open. And, uh, so generating revenue and taking on a challenge is really important. Uh, but the seltzers are good fun, you know, they taste nice. And we wanted to take a, the approach of everything being natural uh, and low calorie and healthy. So there's no added, no artificial colors and there's no artificial flavorings. Everything's natural and put into them. And it takes an awful lot of uh, trial and error. So we've only got ourselves up there. And we're trialing our new one that's going to be released next week yesterday and we were mixing all of the different components together and we ended up with the first one we must have gone through about 20 different flavors the first one was like mouthwash and uh, i don't know what the last one tasted like yet because my palate was just shot by the end of the day <laughs> uh, i think we'll i've had a few seltzers myself and i often think of them as like um light easy to drink and then it's like somebody shouting the flavor of a fruit at me from across the room Lime. Yeah. Well put. <laughs> Well, but, but they are good fun and like it's a good way to get um, tipsy without uh, tasting alcohol. I think it's alcohol. a perfect canal can, I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. Go for an El Canal can. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you're not inclined for cans, this is this is very similar to a seltzer. And more and, environmentally sustainable. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah. aluminium, what, 79% of the aluminium ever produced in the world is still in circulation. Like, cans are infinitely recyclable. So, I mean, that's it's pretty... Well, will you recycle it if you're on the canal? <laughs> I just, I, I, I'm not condoning nor promoting canal cans, uh, no matter how fun oh, they are. I'm promoting and condoning canal cans. <laughs> Classic um, job of pastime. Exactly. Uh, Brendan, uh, Dave Cummins wants to know, what is your favorite wine cask to work with so far? The wine cask, uh, in terms of wine itself, it would be the Basque Chocolina cask, uh, purely because, you know, uh, it's it's like a shunned upon wine and uh, it actually is quite aggressive. It's completely different from all the other wines. And it's got, I think it's got 
the most um, regionalism compared to any other wine. It's just the fact that it's got its own grape that's indigenous to that part of, of the world, to the Basque country, and it's been there for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, and it's it's quite zero fetic as well, so it's it's resistant against those Atlantic salt waters, and it's got a thicker skin as a result of a, and a bigger seed, so it's quite tannic, and those flavours work their way over it, and it, it's quite a refreshing drink then. And uh, for that to be, you know, transferred into our wine, plus it had virgin acacia heads, so that they're, you know, aggressive wood spice as well. It just created a very different uh, expression in the whiskey. Did you get um, to try is, the exact wine that was from that cask, or was it bought through a cask seller again? Yeah, you're right. No, unfortunately, we didn't. Uh, there was there was. Uh, few foul words exchanged as a result of that but uh, no I, I went to the Basque Country and I think I visited most of the wineries there anyway so <laughs> there's a slight different dialect uh, between you know the Bilbao crew and uh, the San Sebastian crew. Uh, yeah. San Sebastian they're a bit more elaborate and they're pouring it from a height and they, you know down in Bilbao they're a bit more grounded and they just pour it into the glass and they say the guys up there are cowboys there's no point in doing that it's, it's all just theatre but theatre is a big part of it you know and, oh, uh, storytelling is a massive part of every industry, I think. It is indeed. No, it is indeed. And cuisine is much more particular up, up in San Sebastian as well. So there, there's a nice range, even within such a small country, of chocolate wine. And something that I've become more and more interested over the last couple of years. And to get that into a wine cask it was brilliant. Uh, just <laughs> thought it was good fun. Plus, I don't think anybody's done it before either. Uh, there you go. That's a nice first on the label. I'm talking about your uh, theatre of of, uh, of long pours and throwing throwing uh, drinks. Up in Basque Country region is the the Spanish sidra, the kind of like naturally carbonated, like very low CO two cider that they throw from like massive heights to carbonate, and it's very yeah. funky, kind of saisony. And they have competitions that are like seven year old kids throwing uh, <laughs> right. cider. But they're not drinking it at the end. The competition is just mm. the length and distance of throwing, essentially. Um, but it's very kind of uh, traditional to that part of the world, I suppose. Uh, and mm. the rest of Spain, apparently, just I've tried to find you know, kind of Basque cider uh, around Spain, and nobody isn't interested in giving it to me. So, um, <laughs> yes. a, a, a few people have been asking there, Brendan, uh, when will uh, your Pinot Noir cast be on sale? Uh, uh, when, where, and for how much? So it's going on sale tomorrow morning at uh, 9 a.m. And uh, the RRP in the UK is around £80 per bottle. And in the Republic, it's £90 per bottle. So uh, I think it tends to go around 95 Sorry, Euro, that is, in the Republic. So, yeah. You're talking oh. 80 starting or 90, 95 Euro. Okay. And who are the distributors? Sorry? Uh, who's the retailers? Yeah, oh, it's um, in the UK and Ireland, it's Irish Malts, and in uh, the Republic of Ireland, then it's Celtic Whiskey Shop. Cool. We're in Maine too. And there's another couple as well, KWM Wines, some small amount. They actually leaked some early, unfortunately. Uh, so <laughs> there was a guy down in County Meath, of all places, with a bottle a couple of days ago, who was most obliging when we asked him to remove it from social media. <laughs> Well, at least, at least he was he was nice about taking it down. I suppose. Indeed, gentleman. Call oh, gentleman. <laughs> um, I, 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 an interesting question here from Richie Phelan: whether or not I'd be able to get it in Sweden at any stage. I presume both Celtic whiskey and Irish malt would be obliging to ship to, uh, to the Nordic region. Yeah, as, uh, providing the, the the government allows it to come in, then yeah, there shouldn't be any issue. The guys would ship the ship worldwide. There might be a little bit of an issue right now with Australia because there's not too many planes going. So I think they might have closed down their Australian shippings for you know, just a couple of months. But yeah, everywhere else is fine. Cool. Um, any, any sneak peek of anything coming up in terms of uh, Cologne? Or are we, uh, are we just uh, prying? Yeah, well, there's one thing coming. There's a few things that we don't want to talk about, but I suppose there's one thing that's very exclusive. Uh, you know, Pachin's got a bad history, and for us, we we're always trying to premiumize Pachin, and you know that's a it's a it's a tough move to make, and you know it's a thankless task, and it's there's no profit in it, but it's it's certainly I think we think Pachin can have integrity, and uh, we're actually going to release a batch of Pachins uh, very very close in the future. Uh, there's only going to be two hundred of them, and they're going to be a set of five small bottles, and 
uh, they're going to be, you know, they're going to represent different parts of the country. Uh, very tastefully done. Um, and they're going to be delicious as well. Will they be here in time for Christmas? I, I hope so. That's the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Look at me. Well, you know, I wouldn't mind five minutes of potchins in my stocking. So <laughs> it's great. Like if you age a really high quality spirit, you know, for I think you're only allowed for ten weeks. Again, some gobshites wrote all the GIs. So if you you're you're allowed to age it for ten weeks in a cask, and then take it out, and it's it's crazy what can happen in a small firkin in ten weeks if you've got a good quality spirit. My what granddad used to make potchins on the last free plot of land just off Sheriff Street and nice. like nobody owned it. And mm. so they'd leave it there just in case the guards came so that, you know, you couldn't blame anyone or claim it. And sure he was buried with a bit of it. Oh. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. yeah, because you had to make it in common edge, didn't you? So that you, exactly. you know, don't make the national still. And, and he used to weird. go and drive around on the horse and buggy and give people um their coal and their putting. <laughs> good on him. Probably yeah. saved many like <laughs> ah, he was a mad bastard. <laughs> <laughs> well put. <laughs> There's grumble tom. That's my That's friend. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um. So I uh, I suppose then we'll be keeping an eye out for some putching. Um. Saturday is the release of the Pinot Noir cask at circa eighty pounds nineteen ninety five euro. Yeah. Um. With our nice blacked out back label yeah sharpie culture exactly um and then uh, a few a few nice premium uh, yeah it's confusing the the camera's uh, inverted or, or reversed on this i always end up going like way off screen trying to bring it in um you should you just shake your head to figure out yeah, i noticed it when i logged in and i was like that's not the way my head is actually moving <laughs> i i do that all the time i'm like look at this bottle i'm like oh, oh. <laughs> It's handy though because it puts it puts whatever it puts you the font in the right way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, Brendan, I very much appreciate you uh, taking the time in the evening because I know you were uh, busy this evening um, and apparently uh, getting over a hangover of all the tasting you did yesterday. So uh, <laughs> it's very much appreciated, man. Um, no and as the as the longest running recurring guest, uh, we, we must have you co-hosting at some point as well. Um, yeah, no problem. She'll see you next week. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right, Brendan. Uh, feel free to hang out in the back room if you want. Uh, yeah. I know you like you like to listen in, so uh, maybe we'll, yeah. we'll bring you back on if you're still here. If not, uh, appreciate it, and we'll uh, talk to you a little bit later on. No bother at all. Thanks very much. All right, Jimmy. Nice chat to you. Great to see you again. All right. Bye. Oh, I cut him off in the middle of Sloan, but um, that All was fun. Cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, Shmeem, I suppose um, we've, that's kind of the first the first thing we want to talk about this evening, um, but we have a lot to get through. Uh, lots have happened uh, in the last couple of weeks in Irish whiskey. Uh, but one of the things that we wanted to talk about, and particularly, you, you know, you, you brought, uh, brought up uh, um, when we were discussing the kind of topics of tonight, um, was uh, the FDA's uh, approval from from earlier this month on gluten free guidelines? Yeah. Um, do you want to take us through that? Because that's that's kind of a, a quite a big thing for Irish whiskey now. Go on, well. I will. So, like, there's a lot of people that know uh, about uh, distilling, and then there's a lot of people that don't. Right? They don't care to because uh, they don't need to. Uh, but mostly, it's that distilling inherently just removes gluten like it it removes like a lot a lot of things uh but like when you make a grain-based spirit the process itself the distillation in fact just removes all all of the gluten uh but there are people who maybe are practicing gluten-free diets uh that would just assume that because it's made from like a, a barley or a grain um or a malt or, or or whatever that it that it is inherently full of gluten and it took a lot of advocacy on behalf of a lot of uh, spirits uh, companies and unions to uh, talk to the FDA just to give them permission to put the words gluten free on the label uh, without a massive explanation about how distillation works because and that because that takes up a huge amount of you know space on a label that you and you know can ruin the design um <laughs> Uh, so they passed it in the FDA in a, in America uh, this month to say that you can just put the word gluten-free on it 
because of the nature of distillation, which um, means that you can appeal to an entire section of the customer base that maybe you couldn't before, because um, gluten-free is an, is an excellent buzzword, sales word, especially um, with the whole wellness industry, which is a billion dollar industry. Uh, so you can kind of tap that. It's also mostly made up of women, which is a smaller section of um, uh, the current business done globally in w Irish whiskey, which is predominantly, I think, 25 to 45 year old men. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Having having spent a couple of years in the States, uh, the absolute sheer Goliath that is Tito's vodka um, the amount of people that used to, I see in bars, would order Tito's and whatever, and then mm -hmm. demand to be shown that it was Tito's going into the glass because they were uh, like somewhat, somehow gluten intolerant or intolerant. Or, yeah, yeah. Um, and and no matter how much explanation um, went into it, didn't matter. It was Tito's because Tito's is the only one that said gluten free. Um, and then I remember Stoli. Uh, came out with a gluten-free version of their vodka, which I thought was fantastic. Okay. Uh, put it, Probably put a $10 upcharge on the bottle. Um, and that was very much a thing. Um, and to this day, basically no Irish whiskey is able to put, or gin or vodka or whatever, or put gin going to the States, um, which is hilarious because now the ruling from the FDA, which is, I suppose, I think it's coming to effect on 14th, 14th. September. Yeah. Um, will allow uh, <laughs> Brendan dropping back in. Gluten-free, genius. Um, but uh, that'll allow any distilled spirit to use um, the, I suppose, the branding of gluten-free on the products, mm -hmm. uh, which in fairness will uh, have quite a large, I suppose, consumer education to a degree. Uh, but what I find funny is that it's the complete opposite in Europe um, because because it's by des by definition gluten free, you can't put gluten free on a label where the cat like the category is by definition gluten free because yep. it implies inferiority of other products. So cider you can't do it, um, cream liqueurs you can't do it, whiskey you can't do it, vodka like any distilled spirits, but also yep. cider I think was one that always even putting naturally gluten free is is not allowed. It's not allowed, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, but, I think after the FDA move, it could, you know, people wouldn't maybe have legs or precedent to sort of appeal um, that sort of restriction. But it's also not as big of a of a buzzword with uh, European consumers, I think, in the in the way it is with maybe more internationally and American ones, uh, because of the way we market things isn't it doesn't always line up with um the way it's done in, in different countries which is you know evidenced by lots of other things they always have like an ad for europe and an ad for america yeah because sales tactics actually do vary culturally they do and also i i only found this out recently and i was i was mind blown by it um the innocent till proven guilty uh i suppose motto applies in um food labeling as well that uh, you have to prove that something isn't what it says it is for it mm. to not be allowed on the label. So if you make a, I don't know, you can't make a medical claim, but you could say, say gluten-free, and then the, someone has to literally disprove you. Whereas in Europe- that there is gluten in it. <laughs> yeah, whereas in Europe, the producer must prove their claim, the onus of responsibility of the truth is yeah. on the claimant, not the consumer, if that makes sense. So it's yeah. kind of a reverse system. So, Which um, is probably a better system for accessibility as well, because it means that the people producing things have to show that their product is a good product and they don't have to be caught rapid by an intelligent consumer, do you know? True, uh, but also I suppose we we do have a, a fair amount of bias living in the consumer. <laughs> it's always it's always easy to say I that we don't check our bias, but like yeah. you know, acknowledging our bias is the first step towards removing it. I do agree with you though. Uh, yeah. that I think it's a better system, but I do acknowledge that growing up in the system where that exists is 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 in some way. Yeah. I'm sure I think the other way is great if if I grew up in the other system. Well, I think, uh, but I also think if I was a business owner, I would prefer the other system. But as a generally just con, you know a little working class consumer i rather be stuck up for by the courts you know exactly um probably a good moment um i were about halfway through the show mm -hmm. um probably a good moment to uh check in on 
uh, our, our second drop of the evening. Um, so this is the Rome Code Curator Series uh, 0.1. There we go. So it's handy to have the, the labeling facing front there. Um, are you still on the cast strength? <laughs> no. This is the cast strength. I picked up the wrong bottle. I've clearly drank too much cast strength. Exactly. I was going to say, you did exactly what I did at the beginning. This is uh, I, by far my favorite uh, Rome Co. Um, not to be biased against the other uh, Rome Co's, but this I think is absolutely fantastic. Uh, really, really high uh, percentage of malt in this. Uh, I was talking to Alan earlier. It's it's just shy, I think, 48% 11-year-old malt and port, 48% um, uh, non-age statement malt in bourbon, and then like 4% grain blended together. Um, this is just, for me, this is absolutely stunning whiskey. They released it when they opened the, the distillery. Um, full of flavor, lots of dried fruits. Um, they mentioned actually on the label, this is one of my favorite things. When I first saw this kind of coming out, um, their tasting notes are of Irish hedgerow, gorse flower, and honeyed cream. Um, so I, I like, to be honest, when I saw this coming out first, I was like, oh, Rome Coke from with the gin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> until I was informed otherwise. Um, the very interesting tasting notes. Um, well, like, it, I, I like the tasting notes because what I thought when I tasted it was that it was quite autumnal. Like the, it re reminded me of like Halloween, <laughs> which would make like a lot of sense because it's like that sort of like gorse and blackberries and that's kind of when they're all ripe and stuff. So like, you know. Yeah. And and I, I was also saying like the kind of, uh, I, I did a, a nice lovely photo shoot of, of one of the, of that Rowan Co. bottle uh, in a lot of gorse flowers outside my apartment uh, when gorse was, well, at least uh, summer gorse was blooming. Uh, and it's kind of a compound flavor because gorse flour mm. is essentially vanilla and coconut um, kind of mixed together. So you get a lot of that in, in the glass. Um, and I think it is one of those things that it kind of uh, has kind of a honey flavor to it. It's got a, a, a viscous mouthfeel, yeah. um, a little bit of uh, citrus going in the background as well. But yeah, this 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 for me is is absolutely dynamite. I'm, I'm a big fan of this. Um, so I suppose Sancha at this point, uh, and Alan, uh, who, who is commenting still, uh, if you've any uh, points to add about this, uh, do feel free in the comments. Uh, but apart from that, I'm going to enjoy this sip. Mm -hmm. It's very different to the cask strength, so the sort of lighter, sweeter sort of um, flavors from the uh, cask strength are quite complemented even with the afterwards, because the richness of the port, I think, really comes through yeah um in it and there's just like the citrusy sort of berries is is, is really nice <laughs> it's I agree. 46, Dave. <laughs> it is 46 um but now this is actually um this is one i had a bottle i got a bottle a while ago and there's there's that much left in it um <laughs> so i have i have enjoyed this quite a lot um and now I have a second open bottle, which I'm I'm very pleased about. But this no, this is a this is a absolute one I keep on the shelf. It is absolutely delicious. A lot of flavor. A lot of like, <laughs> this is almost actually in the kind of compass box region where they made a a blended whiskey with like one percent grain, just to make the point of uh, that blended whiskeys can be uh, anything with with mixes four percent grain um, and almost fifty percent eleven year old malt. So now this is this is stellar whiskey for me. And Alan, I mean, confirming that it is forty six percent. So. We, we weren't far, well, we were right, but we weren't far away. Yeah. <laughs> oh, on the money. Exactly, on the money indeed. So I suppose we'll, we'll keep ourselves going. Um, we have our Rome Co's. I still have my highball. You still have your two neats. Um, I suppose the next thing I wanted to talk about, there's a few people still messaging in. So if you do have any questions at any point, do shoot them our way. Um, the next thing I want to talk about was uh, the teeling 37 year old. Uh, yes. That, that was announced a few weeks ago. Um, super, I suppose, super premium, uh, but a, kind of a very interesting whiskey coming out, having seen the likes of um, JJ Corey's The Chosen and the likes <laughs> of Milton's, uh Silent Distillery. Um, 37, excuse me, 37 year old single malt, all expert matured. Um, one of the eldest Irish whiskeys. I think it'll probably be seventh or eighth at this point mm -hmm. uh, released. Um, and there's only 175 bottles. Yeah. 
at, at seven grand a bottle. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make a wild uh, I'm gonna make a wild uh, proclamation that probably nobody watching this is going to have a bottle sitting at home cracked open. But you never know. Maybe we have some very rich friends and and, uh, and viewers. Um, if, if they are there, I will I will happily consult with you and. <laughs> <laughs> If you guys have some in stock, make sure to plug it because uh, I'm sure you can sell it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah distilled in uh, in '83, um, so a full ten years before I was born. So that was fun. Uh, it was sitting in a warehouse already old enough to uh, be released as a, a nice ten year old whiskey at the point. Um, but f I thought it was really cool. Forty one point three percent ABV. Cast strength. Uh, cast strength. <laughs> exactly. Like that they needed to release this soon because yeah. that was that was about to the drop. Angels were getting drunk. <laughs> exactly. Like had that dropped below the 40% threshold, that was no longer whiskey. Like that, yeah. that was they were they were pushing that close to the, the wire on that one. Um kind of I cool. thought I read somewhere that 37 was like an important number to them as well, and that was like their ideal year to release it. Um I mean, yeah, I yeah. think it's their, I think it's their address in Dublin Eight. I feel like thirty seven is is there. I'll, I'll I'll take it. I'll take it. I mean, if I had a thirty seven year old whiskey sitting in the warehouse, it would be a very important number to me, also. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I, I, you're looking at a what well, a grand per hundred mil. So it's going to be a, a very, I suppose, elusive Irish whiskey. I remember uh, reading the press release, and they said that it, it's. It's for the Irish market with a select couple of international markets uh, where there will also be retailing. So they obviously have some. Uh, Asia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Some Hong Kongers are looking for some nice premium mm -hmm. Irish whiskeys. Uh, they've got them covered. Um, sad to say, we don't have a sample of it sitting here, which. Uh, oh, we would be open to it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, Alan Mulvihill dropping in again from Rome Coach saying, thanks for the kind words means a lot to see when people are enjoying the booze absolutely um so far um i think i am definitely enjoying all the booze um that you guys are making um then uh as i as i just said important customers uh jamie Cotter dropped in say important financially yes um any customers that are buying and selling seven grand bottles of irish whiskey i think are very important uh financial customers to any irish whiskey company and i think anybody would be delighted to have those customers so <laughs> uh more power to them i suppose at that point um definitely the oldest uh single malt released by um teeling trying to think any L older irish whiskey single malts i know there's older pot stills um, yeah off the top of my head i can't think of any no. older if if anyone, oh well, actually the sorry the the Middleton uh, Lost Distillery or Silent Distillery uh, release their forty seven year old was a peated single malt, uh, which uh, which always uh, skips my mind being the famous pot still distillery. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, apart from that, maybe second eldest. If anyone wants to comment on that, because I know there's Caden Heads bottlings of um, of Irish whiskey, which I think is hilarious. A lot of the Caden Head ones are. 44 and 42 years old uh, with like 70% alcohol uh, in the bottle, which is just absolutely wild. Um, but yeah, I suppose moving on a little bit, um, just because I'm keeping an eye on the time, um, Whiskey Live, uh, Dublin. No. Um, yeah, I mean, Whiskey Live being cancelled was a big blow to not only the smaller distilleries that need the exposure, especially from like devout whiskey drinkers that go, but also the people that they bring with them for like, you know, the expansion of their brand. It's also a really big loss to, I think, the whiskey community as a whole, because while we're super active on social media, you know, sups and sips and hashtags and, and whatever we're not always in the same room together and i found that last year it was really nice to put a face to the you know tag number and <laughs> um, i'd be like oh i know you by your instagram handle you're a real person you know yeah. and, and i think that the, that the sense of community has always been important to irish whiskey you know back into the 1800s and right through the you know renaissance and into where we are now and I don't know, the resurgence. <laughs> um, and I think that that's a massive blow to like to to people 
I don't know how the casks the rent crusade are going to unionize and take down the accountants without it, you know? True, um, true. I mean, they're doing a pretty good job. The cat just on this is, is not the point of what we're talking about. I know, but sorry. They <laughs> um, are doing a very good job at getting a number of cast strength whiskies onto the market. And, and actually, one of the things we mentioned earlier was the WD O'Connell whiskies mm. that were announced today. An 18 year old and a, a cast strength 18 year old PX finish and a cast strength Bill Phil uh, peated whiskey. So, I mean, yeah. they're doing, even just today, they're doing quite well. Just on I think the that they've proved that it's financially viable, uh, despite what accountants say, because they will pay top dollar for it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Brendan dropped me back in to say Whiskey Live is a celebration of everyone's hard work, too. Thank God for Belfast Whiskey Week this year. And that is a good point um, mm -hmm. that Whiskey Live is almost as much of a kind of a celebration. And like you said as well, like for the for both the consumers, but also the kind of producers as well to see the Irish whiskey community kind of as a whole. Um, and the camaraderie of it, you know, yeah. like you pop out on your little break and you're like, what has Jarlath got under the table? You know, let me pop back to Pierce Lyons and, you know, see what they're and because there's always the under the table and stuff. And there's always the like, oh, I know you by your whatever. Let's have a let's have a chat and you know. Jamie <laughs> uh, Potter dropping back in to say he remembers having a drunk chat with yourself outside sixty sixty one about knowing Twitter handles. So I mean, it, an apt an apt conversation apparently. Well, I'm on brand, if nothing else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you speak the truth. Um, but yeah, I mean, like that's the thing as well. Like I, you know, I've I've both been a consumer at a number of whiskey lives in Dublin and also behind the table. And it's very much, you know, I've, I think last year I was at in 22 different countries doing whiskey festivals all over the place. And the consumers are, are very varied and, and whatnot. And then it comes to Dublin and it's just like, get everyone that doesn't know your product away, like from yeah. your company away from it. It's like the P <laughs> this is the one show where you need to be like on point. If you, I wrote a survival guide to it last year and I was like, make sure you get your coffee beforehand. Have some hot water and lemon under the table. You will lose your voice. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and, and it's always funny because it's, you know, in, in many ways when you're at Whiskey Live, you'll see very different consumers. It would be the kind of seasoned whiskey fabric. And people, you know, when I first went to Whiskey Live, I think it was like 21 and then you'd see the people, you'll see like the group of the like the 21 year old enthusiasts going around doing their, their like they've planned the whole idea, where they're going, how they're going to go about it. And then halfway through, it's the like 50 year old respectable businessman in a suit getting kicked out for being too drunk. And then the 21 year olds are like, well, yes, uh, you can you can absolutely smell the the vanilla and the, and the menthol in this. And it, it's, it's, it's a very fun and funny dynamic at the same time. Um, I think because I've been gone from being a, a consumer to, um, uh, you know, a facilitator. Small pores are everyone's friend. I know that sometimes the consumer will look at you and be like, ah, that's a bit stingy. But I'm like, there's 200 whiskeys here. You don't don't underestimate how much that that is going to hit you. And yeah. then even like as a as a person on the on the other side, I don't want to be hit in the face in public, you know, by the whiskey that I wanted to just taste a bit. Of. Yeah. Um, and the likes of and one of the things I was kind of I was kind of surprised about uh, as well with Whiskey Live was the kind of the sidearm of Whiskey Live was the Irish Whiskey Awards as well, um, which was also cancelled this year. Which I I yeah. had I had a which is which is you know of the thousands of of, of online and and whiskey awards ceremonies around the world, this is is the one for Irish whiskey producer. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and, you know, obviously being a, a free charitable event, free to enter um, with it being judged by the whiskey community at large um, mm -hmm. is very much a kind of a, repre a representative of the palette of the day, if that makes sense. And, and I think, you know, like last year it was in, um, in Dingle and there was still a massive show. Like everybody, there was lash and rain and everyone was like, hurrah, <laughs> you know. Exactly, and and it, that was one of the things I thought. If the if the whiskey fa if whiskey live hadn't moved online, I would have thought that um, 
the Whiskey Awards would have moved online. The Whiskey Awards were cancelled long before Whiskey Live was. Whiskey Live is kind of cancelled either at the beginning of this month or just the end of last month. Um, but the the with the Whiskey Awards cancelled quite quite a while ago. And um, sad to see them not on, but obviously in in the midst of a global pandemic, probably a very good idea not to have them on. Um, so, but I suppose when it's a logistics point of view to try to get out the Whiskey Awards to the sheer numbers of people. I that think were even just ball. judging them would have probably been very difficult as well because you now suddenly need a room that's twice as big to fit the same amount of people. And we all know space is at a premium in Dublin. Uh, even if they weren't in Dublin, then, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. I feel quite like sad for Celtic Whiskey because they've worked really hard to establish these like yearly like milestones and traditions and stuff. And just to see um, something completely beyond your power kind of like restructure your whole year it's hard absolutely um jamie cotter dropping back in says gutted to and uh, won't get to watch people not be in a panic while the fire alarm goes off anyone who wasn't at whiskey live dublin last year the fire alarm went off for quite a while and also it went into kind of a silent mode kind of repetitively so it would alarm for like two or three minutes where everyone would start leaving and it would go into a silent mode I presume to allow people to leave, but then because it was st it was still alarming, the lights were still going on and off, but the sound wasn't. Everyone just kind of came back and it would go off again, and then they'd come back, and then it would go. And it was a very strange, funny, repetitive thing going on, and it was uh, it was unfortunate to kind of disrupt the night, but it was, as Jamie said, quite funny to. to it was watch. the drunkest session as well, like the the Saturday afternoon one. That was yeah. the one where everyone was a bit more gung-ho about it <laughs> exactly exactly um but as as a few people have said uh, thank god for uh, <laughs> dave cummins saying it was absolutely hilarious mass confusion i mass confusion indeed i also saw a few people um who at least claimed to be fire wardens in their own businesses who were consumers and not in the right mindset to be trying to help helping, which was just, which, and also that the actual fire wardens from the event were like, no, you need to leave. And they're like, well, help. We're like, no, <laughs> just I mean, going. I did that classic Irish thing where I was like, oh, I'll just wait and see what everyone else is getting up to, you know. Yeah, I have I mean, drink. <laughs> we're, we're, we're pretty bad for that, all right. Um, but yeah, I suppose just keeping an eye on the time, I do <laughs> want to catch all up right. on a few more things. Um, this one, though, uh, I, was, I was pretty excited to talk about. Uh, Schlieve League's first uh, Irish whiskey uh, spirit distillation in Donegal in 180 years, um, which is pretty cool, like, on all counts. Schlieve League, known for their Andulamon, seaweed gin, and uh, their Silky, uh, the legendary Silky Irish whiskey, mm -hmm. um, which... I just had as my uh, whiskey of the month for July. That well, they're they're kind of peated uh, or lightly peated version. Um, so to have their first distillation um, and a double distilled peated single malt, uh, I know, which it's is quite like, cool. Yeah, it's, it's it's very unusual, and it's also I would say very in character for people in Donegal to be like, this is what I'm gonna do. You know, I'm gonna. Go for it, gung ho. They've also launched their or, or relaunched their um crowdfunding as well, just so that they can kind of get things built to um a certain point that they want. But I was looking them up the other day. Did you see the idiotic um TripAdvisor review that comes up the first thing when you Google them? Uh no, but but pray tell. <laughs> uh. Sorry. I just thought it was quite unusual uh that, that that someone hadn't read the actual bio that is very clear on the website and um, that the distillery is not in fact built or open for uh, visitors yet just being irate that it wasn't in fact built or open for visitors yet yeah um, I, I think one of the things that in the last number of years has kind of gone under the radar and slight you know like distilleries are food processing manufacturing sites they're mm -hmm. not inherently tourist centers and whiskey tourism really has only kind of taken off in the last 20 years maybe even even pushing kind of 10 years maybe and i think a lot of people forget that every distillery or every brewery is 
they're built for production purposes. They're not yeah. built for tour purposes. And not everyone is is situated for that. Um, and I and think not everyone can, can be either. It can't be everyone's priority. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and some are perfectly situated for that. Uh, the Shed are just opening their 3 million euro um, yeah, uh, visitor center. And other places like Cooley Distillery don't let you look through the gates, uh, and and that's perfectly fine. It's a, it's literally a production facility, and in a lot in some cases, it's very much not safe to bring in the general public. Absolutely, uh, people forget uh, that things are warm and cold and delicate, and you know there's actual chemistry and science, you know, happening here. Exactly, and and actually one of the things uh, this is not related to Schlieve League, and I do want to get back to that. Um, <laughs> but the, no, it's fine. I, I rabbit hold with you. Um, digress. One of the my first time going to Ecklandville Distillery very soon after they first opened. Um, Sergius from uh, Irish Whiskey Magazine, long before the Irish Whiskey Magazine was a thing, the two of us drove up to uh, Ecklandville for the day, went on a tour, and I remember as you're leaving the kind of like main area where their column still is and the kind of kind of reception area going into the first kind of fermentation area, it's uh, the walkways are are, are uh, grated to allow CO2 to fall. And I remember, I remember there in Sitter Graham looking at a woman who was in like six inch stiletto high heels. And he was like, I, I don't really know what to tell you. Like this isn't appropriate footwear for a distillery. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, so, I, like, and I remember looking at her and her looking at the greats being like, yeah, this, seems like like this isn't going to work and he was just kind of like this is this Sorry. is just like it's it's yeah. built for working so uh but yeah um it was uh it was interesting to see that and people forget that they are production sites and and agri businesses as well mm -hmm. Turkey agri businesses but agri business nonetheless but back to Schlieve League um yeah. uh first legal whiskey spirit produced in, in Donegal in 180 years. I'm going to put an asterisk on that according to the guys in Schlieve League because yeah. I haven't looked into uh, how, how recent the, the spirits were produced up there legally. Uh, double the silpeated malt and their claim in their press releases was that they want to become the Isla of Ireland, which obviously very cool coming from uh, a historic in a show and kind of putchy, peated putching years would be a very cool kind of return to the past, I think. And the peat was taken from essentially adjacent to their new distillery, which I thought was quite cool. But I also think it's quite the um, uh, goal, you know, it's a, it's, it's a high goal. It's a high bar. Um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, go higher, go home, I suppose. Um, and I, I don't know. I think if you're striving towards something that is it's almost, you know, unattainable to, to, to some degree, you will do really well because you're, you're, you're pushing yourselves further and they also seem to know themselves really well. So it's not all going to be like, Oh, we'll give it a go here. We'll give it a go there and we'll see how we land. It's like, Oh no, I know the style of whiskey that I'm trying to produce and I will keep like uh, trying the, maybe the minute differences till I, till I get to the place that I want to be, which I think is quite admirable. Um, and, and quite, um, I think also really interesting as well to be like particular about what you want to do. Yeah, exactly. And, and and reading, excuse me, reading some of their brand stories, um, excuse me, I know there's a familial connection that one of the founders, is, his grandfather used to produce uh, peated putching in the area, kind of a double distilled uh, on the Schlei putching. Um, so it's very much kind of the legal um, reincarnation of that, which is, which is quite cool. And I think it'll, it'll resonate as well with, with, International peated single malt is obviously a, a, a well understood category around mm -hmm. the world, possibly I, much more so than single pot still as well. I think this the uh, the silky thing is is quite interesting as well because like the the legends and the stories of these like seal people, um, it makes for for a really fascinating read, and they seem to really understand the legend and it's well vocalized like on the back of their labels and stuff as well, which I think is quite a is quite a nice draw um for maybe a different a different style of consumer who is uh, interested in the Irish lore folklore heritage and stuff as well as the whiskey. So you've got like the familial connection, the ancient connection, and the like aspirations for future. And I think like as a whole product and and a whole brand going forward, it's it's very well done. 
Yeah, I agree. And I, I think one of the things that having worked in a number of the different booze categories in, in Ireland for the last couple of years, the one thing I always find is that mythology doesn't sell booze is very much a, 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 a rule I have learned. Whereas the silky seems to, and like with silky and then even not quite to the same mythology, but like on Dulamon and the, you know, you're getting into more, more localized history as well in, in different parts of their branding. It is working for them, which kind of breaks my, there's always exceptions to the rule. Um, uh, and I think they're, they're doing quite well. Uh, open. I, I also think that because silkies are like mermaid like creatures, right? That are, But they are specific to the Irish sort, sort of lore. The mermaid is an aesthetic, you know, like you can look through Instagram and stuff like it. There's there is an entire aesthetic there that that people like cultivate their identity around. And uh, like people have mermaid brushes and mermaid this and mermaid that. And like you could like maybe potentially reach that customer who might not have thought of Irish whiskey as, as an option based on their interest in something else. True, true. I, I feel like that'll be a harder sell for Clonakilty on the whale. Um, I, <laughs> the giant <laughs> whale tail outside the distillery. I mean, uh, maybe maybe boy racers with whale tail spoilers. Um, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see or you yeah. can just make loads of whale puns. That could work, you know. Are you maybe. whale? Because you're looking whale. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to take you, I'm going to remove you from this live stream. No, uh, Jamie, uh, dropped in saying he better rethink his battle on a hinge Banshee whiskey. Banshees on just on a side note are one of my favorite, <laughs> my favorite parts of, uh, Irish, uh, Irish mythology, um, that no one ever gives us credit for. Um, I, I think, uh, Banshees are Banshees, Banshees, fairies and leprechauns are all pricks. Uh, heard it here first. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I'll take that to the bank. <laughs> exactly exactly um so i think we're kind of coming to an end we've we've definitely hit our time uh, a lot of people still still with us um one of the things i do want to say is a very big thank you to our sponsors for for this evening uh Ro and co irish whiskey and alan uh thank you very much for following along brendan from clone whiskey um thank you for joining us especially with the launch of your uh pinot noir cask saturday irish malts uh, Celtic Whiskey Shop. Um, and Shmim, you're an absolute pleasure to have on the show. Uh, thank you for bringing uh, your insight into both international whiskey news and into wine. Um, and to everyone who has been watching, a uh, very large thank you. Um, and I've I've very much enjoyed tonight. I hope you have too. Um, and I again, have you. thank you for having me. And we'll have our this, this This is absolutely the jam. There you go. Uh, um, <laughs> So, uh, oh, sorry, Brendan. Brendan has come in to say that I was incorrect. He's launching uh, tomorrow, not Saturday. Tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. There's not one for spelling. Look, we have on to brand. Leave on on brand. It gets it gets worse. Uh, <laughs> tomorrow release nine a.m. Um, but yeah, um, a very big thank you, I suppose, to everyone who's involved so far. Um, we will be back with Postal Live. We're going to uh, kind of a bi-monthly or bi-weekly basis twice a month they both mean what either twice the same fortnightly is the word i would use fortnightly there you go because that's because bi-weekly means either twice a week or once every two weeks and bi-monthly either means twice a month or once every two months that is really confusing fortnightly is absolutely the word i'm going to use from now on um so we'll be back two thursdays from now uh mr dave cummins uh will be joining me on the show um, so I hope to see you all then. Um, we have some, and Grumbleton come back in. <laughs> so, uh, um, you, thank you very much, uh, to everyone else. Thank you for joining us. And, uh, that's a wrap from us. Thanks.